Yeah. 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 Ready? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, Ready to roll. Okay, good morning and welcome to the, the last Planning and Environment Committee meeting for 2020. And as is normal, we pay our respects to the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. And we also spare a thought for the traditional owners to our north and the bachelor and they're dealing with the significant loss of biodiversity as a result of the fires that are going through Fraser Island. Um, once again, an indication of the ever-increasing dryness during spring that for millennia they would not have had to cope with on that island. So we move to item one, and item one is a mature change of use for a development application. Oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. I always miss those ones up the top. We have no apologies. We are all in attendance and we need to confirm the minutes of the Planning and Environment Committee. Do I have a mover? No second. And a second is that <coughs> Council Pinsel and Council Stewart. Do we have any discussion on those minutes? No? no. All those in favour? There being no presentations or deputations, we then move on to the first item, which is a mature change of use for the development application on a commercial business type 1 office multiple housing type for conventional and retail business type 2 for a shop and salon at 6 to 10 Diamond Street for all. Um, this has been requested to be referred to me and there is yeah. a Yes, screens just... Um, frozen. Yeah, frozen. <coughs> so the... It's go down through Sydney now. I think All right. I can give you a declaration. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. So, yes, there's a de declaration of a conflict of interest by the Mayor. Thank you. Oh, it's back up. Oh. No. Um, I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as Peter Zip, a director of Creek Gold, PTYRTD, who donated to my election campaign in March 2020, has an interest in this application. Mr. Zip attended the pre-lodgement meeting on behalf of the applicant. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank you. We shall record that declaration. We don't need to vote on it. And yes, at this uh, council board would have requested this matter go to general committee because of the significance of the matter, but do we have questions and queries of staff prior to the general committee so they can prepare. Councillor yes. Swingman. Um, I, I note that there is no um, in and out from the Diamond Lane. Um, it, it seems, and, and I, I question that because it, it says here that the planners looked at that. Did they look at that in light of the fact that there's probably going to be lights traffic lights at the intersection and that will impede getting in and out of there in and out of that the front parking lot and there'll be a lot going into there's 42 car parks and then the next half of the question is you got the news agency right there and with this with the traffic lights that traffic flow and stopping in front of their shop will be affected as well in the future do, is it an oversight to not have an entry from Diamond Lane, do you think? Um, we sent this to an external traffic consultant. Uh, the question was raised with the applicant. Um, but on balance, when you look at um, Diamond Lane, there's residential uh, access to the second half of Diamond Lane as well. So it was whether or not we wanted to put more traffic through past all those residential buildings as well. Um, the DTMR was also involved because they're a referral agency and they required some upgrade to um, Diamond Street for the entry. Um, there was no need in terms of traffic generation to use Diamond Lane through our traffic experts. So I've got a follow up question. So the adjacent development considered the issue of Diamond Lane um, and there was, I think, a wider path bikeway coming out of that development in Diamond Lane. Um, 
One of the, uh, and this is a difficulty we've given a lot of Delta people would come to our final decision on how to treat one. One of the mm. options was actually to bollard off above this development so the residential traffic would come and go, but uh, sort of more commercial laneway effect in this end of the dominant lane. Is that anything that was considered? It's a little bit premature to start because you would need turnarounds, etc., etc. Um, we did look at the pedestrian access from this development across to the Bowls Club and more details getting provided with that through the, the downstream applications. But it's a bit premature. We, you know, the external traffic consultants and council's infrastructure department, they also looked at maybe making it one way. Which way do you make it one way? Um, if you do bollard off some of the lane, it's a, a matter of, well, what about if where's the turnaround, how do they get in and out, what sort of traffic generation are we going to get from this development and the impact on uh, how that would fact affect the uh, residential development. So it's not like, a, say, Wimmers Lane, where it was all, it's all commercial. This one's, oh, well, 50-50. So we have half residential and half commercial. And uh, these, there was, look, there was nothing that stood out to say that they needed to use uh, Diamond Lane in terms of traffic. So you may know, but if not Monday, it's fine. Um, I think the width of the the pathway coming out of the other development, the opposite side of Diamond Lane, is more than the one and a half metres you talk about. And I think it's like coming into the development, if you're on a bike, you're more likely to use a roadway, but going out there, there's only that one access. Can we make sure that the width of that path is suitable for a shared pathway? Is that the path coming out of the bowls yeah, so site? The, the, yeah. So the other development. Yeah. We widen that path to make this leap. Yeah. Condition of development, I think. And yeah, just it just I don't know whether it's proposed, but when I looked at conditions, I couldn't see anything that suggested yeah, that yeah. needs okay, to be a okay. wider leap. Because if you are on your bike going through there, it, it might be complex with pedestrians. But just have a look at that before cool Monday. Yes. Oh, that was the access through the, the other development at the rear between the Bowls Club and the development. There was that link through. Okay, I gotcha. That development's a little bit different too. It had access from from the laneway. Yeah, it did. Yeah. I'm just thinking about if I was riding to school or anything, I'd like to take that corner, I'd probably go through this car park and I'd probably go out the park and go around yeah. there. And so we'd probably avoid that whole lights in a second. So we just want to make sure that mm -hmm. the bikeway or shared way goes yeah. through there. So condition of approval requires a public thoroughfare over the rear of the site to provide for that sort of redevelopment of the laneway in the future. Um, I'm not sure it's warranted that this development should have to widen the laneway. No, no, not the laneway. Yeah. Just the, um, after the bitumen, you show a, a path going right. out yep. in the condition that looked like it's only one and a half metres, but yep. it was going to be shared between bike and their two, which would be at least two and a half. Yeah, okay. Go out there, and that's all I'm saying. So just going feeling an extra piece, yeah. yeah. Just okay. widening the, the width of the pedestrian access. Okay. So where is this grade? The rear of this site, there's a pedestrian access or Showing it out to the online. Oh, you can put up. Hold on. Let's put it up. Sometimes. Post 24. In the agenda? Yeah. So if we, if we go to page 24, just look in. Oh, no, not that one. Page 14 would be good. Is this one here? Yeah, page 14. So and that, then, yeah. is this one right? Your right little here. finger yeah. has. Yeah. Okay. Um, Just that orange section down the bottom, fair beside the number 23. Is that it, right? No, no. The easiest one, guys, on the screen. So, so that. Yeah. 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 So. Maybe if we go to, sorry, page 16 first, we'll just have a look at the surrounding area. So you talk to <coughs> the other development that Brian's referring to. Page 16. Page 16. Yeah. So Brian, sorry, uh, there's a pedestrian access through that vacant lot on Elm Street yes. on, on the eastern side yeah. that runs up the eastern side between along that boundary with the Bowls Club. Yeah. And then it scoots along the lane and into this site. Yeah, that's the, that's yeah, the connection yeah. you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mr. Chairman, on their side. Uh, while we're talking about Diamond Lane, um, there's quite a few residents along there. Was uh, consideration of um, putting commercial quantities of traffic on the Diamond Lane from that development a consideration in not allowing an access yeah. from that into Diamond Lane? Yeah. Was partially yes. Yeah. 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 What about the width of the Diamond Lane? I drove through there yesterday and there seems little room for expansion at any point in time. Was the width or the room for a larger road development to put, say, waste management vehicles in there or things like that? Um, un under the superseded planning scheme, which this one's been assessed against, um, we've had a, a policy of uh, taking one and a half metres of in the... the of the of the land each side of di of, mm. of the laneways, and they've uh, either been through um, w road widening, or if there's um, or a public thoroughfare easement to be used in the future if required. So, uh, Wimmers Lane has uh, there's been a number of developments along Wimmers Lane where the road has been widened and two uh, one and a half or two metres have been taken on each side. Mm. Um, in Diamond Lane. Uh, the, the vacant lot, there's been some uh, road widening one and a half metres on the corner as well mm. and uh, conditions on this approval, on this recommendation uh, requiring a one and a half metre public thoroughfare easement. So in the future, if there's a need to widen the lane, mm. then that is there for that purpose. Yeah, so we've, the conditions cater for that possibility in the future, but we're not asking the developer to construct because they're not obtaining access by the laneway. So okay. it's not reasonable to make them upgrade the laneway when they're not putting any traffic. But there is provision moving forward. But there's provision moving yeah. forward in the future. The other interesting thing for me in terms of that, um, whether or not there should be access off Diamond Lane, the argument against doing that would be to create a rat running you know, yeah. flight to come in as well. That would be a good argument not to have yes. um, access into Diamond Lane. Otherwise, when people are coming down Diamond Street or from Dosa towards Karoi, you see the lights are red that come in through the car park out through the lane and you have a, mm. a fair bit of rat running going on there which you don't want to encourage. Yeah, There is a significant increase of traffic around that um, intersection. I travel through there every day, especially given there's no pedestrian access across to the railway line in terms of crossing or anything currently there. Um, there for me, there is a concern with you know um, waste trucks and commercial vehicles having to enter in through the front yeah. there, the front access. How did the traffic management experts advise you on that? Yes, the um, it was all at the uh, Main Roads Department. The uh, Department of Main Roads was also involved because it's their road. Mm. So they had to demonstrate um, the, the, the number of waste vehicles in and out of the site to make sure that when they turned in that they could um, access safely and also exit safely. There's going to be a medium put um, in the middle of Diamond Street so there won't be any right turn into the development. It'll be left in, left out only. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah, so that was a requirement of the of the main roads department. Yeah, so that'd be like a little service road once you put that in. No, yeah. it's like a medium strip, so it'll if you're coming heading so east. Island. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that just helps manage the traffic. Mm. So um, essentially, we've had uh, our own external traffic consultant review it, but Main Roads has also undertaken the review to be satisfied the development's going to mm. work. Mm -hmm. um, and was there any feedback from the? Um, current business owners or residents around there with regards to the development in terms of the impact with the traffic or what complaints did anyone how many complaints did we get over this developer yeah um, it was impact accessible and um, it went out for public notification and there wasn't any submissions at all um, I had a verbal discussion with um, a business um, Rob Ritchie uh, about that and there was no concerns were raised. No concerns. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just in reference to the traffic, <coughs> I had a look at that, um, and 
there was a little bit of study done about the intersection of Elm and Diamond Street, and they looked at the traffic volumes and they identified as the increases being minor. Can I ask when that report was done? Uh, this was first. Um, look, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm sorry, it would have been done uh, early last year. The application was submitted um, early last year. Uh, so it's likely to have been done in early 2019, um, la yeah, last year. One of the solutions I think mentioned in the report was the upgrade of Diamond and Elm Street to be undertaken by the Department of Transport and Mains Roads. Um, where are we with that? That's not related to this application. That's up to Main Roads to determine their funding and what design they want to do on that. That's a Main Roads issue, not so separate to this separate application. To this application yeah. Okay, thank you. And the sooner the better at the end. Sooner, absolutely, <laughs> because that, that'll yeah. mitigate um, traffic concerns. Mm -hmm. Could I also add, sorry, through the chair, could I also add that because they were a referral agency in there, they considered the upgrade to that intersection with regard to the entry and exit of, of this development. Yeah. Thank you. Are you saying that coming out of here you can only go left? Correct. So if anybody wanted to turn right, they would have to go out there's probably, well, whatever, if there's a stoplight there, eventually, then they'll have to, how will they go to Noosa from here? They would have to go all the way around the block and still cross the road up there. Is that right? Yes, and they could turn right and come. They could turn right into they Elm could turn Street right. as well. This way. Right. They could, uh, sorry, turn right off <laughs> Diamond Street and into right onto Elm. And go yeah. out that way and then go back yeah. the back that way. Yeah. They wouldn't be doing that many hours a day. <clears throat> okay. So, that, I don't know. I, it, it seems it's, that's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's a, that's it's a, a big deal. Traffic. Yeah, so it, it's a balance in terms <laughs> of making sure the traffic works, but also looking after the amenity of nearby residents. So, if you take access from the laneway, then you have issues potentially with impacts on the residents. Residential. The residential, because there's going to be all of a sudden started laneways, right. it's a thoroughfare. Yeah. yeah, and people in that street would not have expected, um, you know, significant increases in the laneway um, to occur. So yeah. it, is, it is a balance. So, so in terms of the traffic management, oh, sorry, going, yeah. what's the plan moving forward in terms of how we're going to manage traffic at that really heavily used intersection, and that is increasing? I know from experience, I travel that every day. What's the plan moving forward? Is there going to be traffic lights proposed that's, that's there? What's technical is there to answer Amelia's question? Is that a main roads intersection or a council intersection? And so they make that decision. Correct. Yeah. And how soon can we expect a decision back from? About three years ago would have been ideal. <laughs> oh. We yeah, that, that's the most uh, that and obviously the intersection over the bridge are two intersections that are probably the most problematical in Noosa. Mm. Um, and they're both main roads intersections, and there's been a couple of designs around for a few years about which way they're going to go. Um, that still isn't in there, uh, locked into their program um, to build those. Um, but that said, it's purely up to main roads as to when they do that. We've lobbied, we've done a lot of mm. work with them over the years to try and get them to, to do it, but that's their call. Okay. Um, so there's not a there's not a, a character or a heritage overlay on this side of Coral yet. Is that a, is that in the works? Is that can we because because that hill is is so amazing with 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 the, the structures on it and so forth. Yeah, um, I'd have to ask strategic planning whether they're considering it because there are a lot of older um, character buildings in that area, um, but I'd have to come back to you on that one. So I think this there is a, a character precinct that runs up to Watson Road. Um, that's right, it does stop uh, yeah. fair enough. So yeah. a lot of those dwellings are covered under the... Up the hill. Up the hill, that's yeah. correct. Oh, good. Okay. Past the cenotaph, heading towards Nusa. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, I suppose a lot of these issues is one of the reasons why I always advocate Croyd as a high priority for local area planning and place making. Um, the laneways, there is a, a real divided opinion, but if you ask engineers, they'll say, why not so the garbage cut the get down there? If you ask people in Croy, they say, no, they're laneways, we want to keep them like they are. So part of the heritage of character precinct is actually not 
making laneway streets and designing the whole town around maintaining that would be one thing we could consider. <coughs> Part of the local area planning it up would be a, a further character assessment to see whether there's anything that can be referred for future um, reviews of the planning scheme that me, that it's sort of where the Bowls Club is from memory is still zoned open space on the new municipal plan. Um, Not sure. Uh, and I think, I think so. what we're looking at here is with two commercial slash residential uh, developments on either side of it with um, uh, multi units beside. I think we've got the opportunity to create a bit of a, a village square on the eastern side of Croydon, which is more self contained. And actually, you know, some people would want to, or both sides of the village, you know, would probably avoid the need for people on that side of town to actually get across the other side as many times if they can do their convenience shopping over this side. So, um, yeah. It is an issue, but have we got? I'm talking. I could be talking on Monday. Now, but is there any other information? Same <laughs> topic on the general committee on Monday. Is anything else? Yeah, I've just got a question on page 18. You've got coloured um, marks on the map. With I can't see a legend. The subject site is coloured yellow. What does that indicate to us? Uh, yeah, the, the zone. Oh, okay. So the the zoning of that is commercials. Uh, community services, mm -hmm. and that reflected the use that was on the site, the Energex depot, under the, under the our now superseded planning scheme. Okay, and is that in conflict with this development? Uh, correct, yes. In what way? Um, the, use, the uses weren't uh, a consistent use on the site, so what that means is that um, it was zoned for um, certain uses, but the uses that they're proposing um, weren't consistent in the community services zone. However, the new New South Wales 2020 has zoned the district centre zone, so if it had been put in today, it would be considered. That's right. It's a fully compliant development under the, the, the new New South Wales 2020. Just one more comment. Brian, you mentioned the word uh, densification the other day, and that's... Um, you weren't talking about one intelligence, <laughs> Uh, but it, in Croy, it seems as though that's the goal. It's, it's, it's going to be denser. And here, this is an example of densification where you have up, upstairs, we have units upstairs and so forth. Part of that densification is going to be the, the, to be able to walk, or, you know, get across the road, get across the railroad track, you know, the, the, the be able to circulation. So that's obviously a big issue for Croy. It's outside of this scope, but um, I'm hoping that this, this fits in very neatly with a much wider plan. Um, for Kuroi and being able to get around the town and the beginning of a, of a densification to get more people in Kuroi so there's less cars and less bikes and as of right now you know from the subjects that you still drive your kids to town on the other side of the railroad track instead of having them cross Elm Street. Yes, pedestrian, pedestrian is not of this here but of the whole town centre with the main road running through it together with all their environmental weeds that they've left there for decades. Yes, so we will refer that matter to General Committee. Uh, do I have a motion to that effect, please? Uh, move Councillor Pindall, second to Councillor Wigner. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour? Carried unanimously, and we can invite the Mayor back into the room. for a material, uh, for an extension to shop, fire and storage facility, <coughs> building at 5256 Gitty Terrace, New Seville. Do you have any declarations? Um, this item has also been requested to go to uh, the General Committee, so if people have questions or further information they wish to be apprised of by next month. On the, the river um, going down towards the boathouse, there are little coffee shops and a few things on the jetties. Um, 
will this person argue that, well, they did it down there, how come you're not letting me do it right here on this jetty? Meaning that, you know, have expanding their, their, their lease, it, it appears. The, the planning scheme allows for those, um, uh, for those little businesses to serve coffee, but with no expansion. So they can trade within what they have and serve their coffee, but there's no expansion of their, their building on, on the jetty for that particular purpose. So there's been no expansion of the others. There's been a change, I guess, um, allowed for to allow them to have coffee and serve those coffee, but that's no expansion of those buildings. Um, the next Monday, it may be worth having some of the property here because I think um, the majority of councils may benefit from understanding the background to land use controls um, between the planning scheme and the land act because we've an extensive process in this little virtual management plan or master plan which address things like um, any have a coffee shop or not and certainly um, we've received further correspondence by the applicant or a representative of the applicant suggesting um, statements made in the report uh, are in conflict with statements verbal statements made by the state I think they've often made those statements we may need to um, make sure it's clear whether the, the officer's advice was inconsistent with the act or actually inconsistent at the time that they were made. Mm. So my suggestion is we do ask some of the property to be here on Monday. Okay. Are we able to have a copy of the statement so we can look at what is suggested to be incorrect? Sure, yeah. There was yeah. Basically, it was in regard to the compliance um, issue and okay. what they'd be verbally, yeah. they were verbally advised by the yeah. state as being permissible and in my mind, had never been permissible under the Land Act. And, yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, I just have a question through the chair. Am I able to put up the images on page 20, what is it, 33 of the report? Just so we have a visual, I'm not, don't deem to be a builder or someone in construction. Um, this just shows the spatial area of what the, applicant is asking for so when we talk about expansion my question is if you look at the roof plan that's been approved and so that would cover the area so the client is asking to just wall that in to store things and whatever the other requests were how then does that violate the requirements because it seems to me that is a logical step that you just question. Yep. Yeah. Build that in. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, the, the, like the, a renovation? The, yeah, the, the planning scheme's got um, a couple of different parameters for building size, and, mm. and there's two of them are site cover and gross floor area. Yep. So the footprint is generally said to be site cover, which is an aerial view, and gross floor area is the amount of floor area that's usable. That's enclosed. That's right. enclosed. Um, so, in although the site cover isn't changing or the footprint's not changing, yeah. the, the gross floor area um, is, and that's the expansion of gross floor area, which the planning scheme uh, outlines. I think this one is one we um, we spent a bit of time looking at it because it seems, you know, at first glance, first mm. blush, but it's very small. Mm. And so you think, well, you know, what what's wrong with that? Even though the mm. scheme's saying no. <coughs> GFA. Yeah. But it, it comes back to what we're trying to achieve here, and that's looking after the Noosa River, which is one of our, our best and most valued natural assets mm. and valued by the community for recreational. <coughs> um, and so what the scheme is trying to do is to look after that. And, it's talk, and it talks about no intensification of commercial use on the river because potentially that will impact on the very values that we have for the river, the environmental values, as well as people's recreational experience. So the scheme is trying to limit the extent of commercial intensification on the river to ensure we still get to enjoy that. So whilst you know 10 square metres doesn't seem a lot to begin with, it's a cumulative impact of what that does. Because we allow expansion of this one by 10 square metres, then the others along the river wish to do the same. And so that's something we need to think very carefully about and be careful about what we do on the river because it's such a well-used public space. Um, and this one, uh, as the report suggests, has a history of compliance mm -hmm. issues.
they're operating really beyond the capacity of their lease. Um, and that's why they're looking for the additional storage space. Um, so, uh, and that's really the reason council that officers have recommended refusal of this one. It's about looking after the river. Mm, I hear what you say, but if if that was to be approved to build in, and then reduces the compliance issues with regards to that. Wouldn't that make more sense to allow them to fill it in? Well, it won't reduce the compliance issues because the compliance issues have been about um, boating craft and and oh, they're and, separate. To yeah, them. so that's not what they're using the extension for. They're wanting to, as we understand it, store life jackets and, and so forth in the site, which is all relating to the, the craft that are going outside the lease area. So that it doesn't address the issue or the compliance issue that's occurred in the past. Okay. All right, thank you. So going back, the site cover with the gross expansion was approved at the initial build. Just the roof is, is yeah. there and it's been approved? Yeah, yes. and it was approved with the gross floor area as seen there without being built in. That's no. right. Yes. So, so that's, I'll ask the question again. Just yeah, I'm sorry, I was to confused. Like, <laughs> just ask again. So maybe if I can paraphrase it. Yeah, sure. So the original approval plan covered the, the roof area, which was uh, the, the site coverage, so to speak. Correct. But not being built in, so the gross floor area was approved without those walls, and what they're looking to do now is that wall. Include, that's correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So I'm just Thank looking, you. Uh, looking at the development approvals here, and can you just clarify or on Monday clarify. I see the operational works 10.2192 in 2011 was for retrospective for that um, thing out the front of what was a lovely little old river shed. Now that approval retrospective means they built it illegally and then someone during Sunshine Coast Council era ignored the plan. Is that right? And now we're seeking to make what is a bastardisation of a, a river shed into a closed enclosed area. Would that be a what, what page, Brian? Uh, page page three. three. Just below these photos, yeah. actually. So if you look. <coughs> Thank you. First off, in the background. The, the, that front roof awning was a retrospective approval. Yeah, um, and it's that's not quite right. <laughs> so <laughs> it was retrospective approval, um, and I don't recall the history of that op works, but... Um, the state in 2014, 2013 changed the leases for all these along the river and they standardised them and made them very generic. Um, so they no longer had the tailored conditions that council over the years had worked with the state to manage the operation of these uses on the river. So when that occurred, um, the leases no longer specified the number of boats and craft and size of boats that were allowed in the lease. So in, in response, officers propose these amendments to the scheme. So this amendment around no increase in GFA, no increase in intensity came in after that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just another question, sorry. When I see a jet ski there, I see that marine facility, uh, uh, the motorbike there, is that just uh, parking or is that, I mean, it's not a, they're not really hiring motorbikes okay. to motor scooters? No, they're not hiring motor scooters to my knowledge. Councillor. Um, just Kerry, so in reference to um, state changes, um, did Dermot allow the vessels or crafts to be stored outside the lease area? And does that explain? I, I'm I'm looking at the amount of compliance um, actions, and they seem to be the same um, the same issues, but the operator just going outside the um, designated lease area and. To me, there seems to be a misunderstanding. I, I can't understand why he keeps repeating the same events. So my question to you is, is it because he's misunderstood DERM policy? Um, does it conflict with council policy? Um, is he allowed under state to leave his vessels outside and then bring them inside at the end of the day? I, 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 I just keep asking the question, why is he keep repeating the same things. Yes. Yeah. Well, the lease, the standard leases include a requirement that they are not allowed to operate outside the lease area or store boats yeah. or anything. Um, so it's consistent with um, the planning scheme that asks for the commercial operations to be within the lease. Um, and certainly with these compliance issues in the past, there's been joint inspections down there by the council's local laws area and state 
to do joint action where required, um, and you know, talking to these leaseholders about ensuring compliance. Um, why are there so many? Um, look, I would only be surmising, so perhaps this may be unfair to the applicant, but I would suggest the fines are too low and the penalty is not high enough. But look, I'm surmising on that, so I'm not sure. This is why I'm talking about heading property up. There is a, a both the Act talks about uh, commercial use of state land, and there is a, a policy called secondary use of state land, neither of which would, uh, in my mind, envisage commercial use of a beach without specific approval. Um, this was one of the most controversial sites during the Noosable Foreshore Master Plan, which I received many complaints about uh, in terms of uh, uh, creating a restaurant or cafe on parkland as well as um, taking up a lot of the beach, inhibiting public access to the beach in that location. So it is something uh, that I think it is good to get staff on Monday to just clarify um, whether the um, supported advice from a DNR officer uh, was in fact correct, um, having been the head of that particular section in that particular office that probably was given that advice. Kerry, I've just got a question. Um, you said that they want to enclose it to store life jackets and things like that. Where are they currently storing them? Um, they're, they're in the, the back <coughs> section. Um, Sorry, I didn't put a photo in, but I have photos where they're storing them. But it's 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 it is a very small space, and they've just got them hanging up, and yeah, it's within within the the shed that they have there now. Would yeah. the enclosure take any of the? And I don't know the answer to this. And you might, to, if if they are using the beach to put things down, and would that take any of sort of, I guess, the chaos off the beach to store it in one spot? Are they putting stuff on the beach that would potentially be? Alleviated by putting it in if they had a storeroom or store area through the chair. Um, the going by the, it's it's mainly the vessels and craft that are outside okay. the lease area. <laughs> it's it's not really the um, the paraphernalia, the okay. you know the eskies and all yep. that type of thing. It's more the craft and the vessels yep. that are usually outside <coughs> the lease area. Yeah. So okay. page thirty provides a description of how they wish to use the space, and that came from the applicant. So it's not about the craft itself. It's no. Wetsuits and buckets and fishing rods and 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 they're currently already being stored somewhere else, not necessarily left on the beach. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll just. The state of the I was only a senior land planner. In regard to state land, I was in another section that office at one stage. That's what I was the last comment, So, um, can I just following on from that, just make a comment? So, the um, what we're here to do today is to, well, we've moved it forward to the next meeting, but it's regarding the application for material change of use regarding extension to shop iron storage building. And is that right? You said to me that the compliance issues are not linked to that, what we're discussing. That's two separate issues. No, that's, that's not what I said. I said there. I'm just asking for yeah, clarification. Yeah, so the yeah. application is to extend that building. That's what we're considering today. Um, yeah. In the report, officers have provided you a history of the compliance issues because we think that's relevant to consideration of the application. Um, but yeah, we're not recommending. But they're not linked to the actual extension request. Can you just expand well, that? Well, the compliance issues to do with like their lease area. The compliance the issues are related to their lease area. Yeah. And why we've, I guess, linked the two issues is we're saying that the compliance issues relate to craft outside their lease. That they have they've expanded their business in such a way that they're outside their lease area. And because they have so many craft, they need so many life jackets and buckets and so forth to support support those craft and that's why they want to expand the lease area and um, we're saying if they complied with their lease area and didn't have the craft outside it they um, wouldn't need necessarily to expand that storage area mm. so the fact that we're operating outside their lease area <coughs> carry to me says that they are currently operating at full capacity mm. so the argument that um, the risk of enclosing these tiny spaces may add to the intensification of the commercial business mm. may not 
staying true? If they're working, you can't go beyond full capacity, can you? Yeah, well, I actually think they're um, operating beyond full capacity because they, they've got it outside the lease area. So they're not only maxed out their lease area, they're now using public space outside their lease area. So they've gone a step further, in, in our opinion. I think we're converging into the bait now. <laughs> so I think it's... Yeah, yeah, just now a question. Do we have a motion meet for Monday? It's probably respond to that now. Yeah. I have just one more question. Yeah. Um, just in regards to enclosing front decks and sides, um, have, has Council ever approved any similar sort of um, enclosures in the past? And is this recommendation consistent with past decisions? Yeah, so since the provisions came into the new scheme that I mentioned, which were changed in response to the state leases being redrafted, um, no, we haven't approved expanded buildings that I'm aware of or can think of. Yeah. Thank you. So the elephant in the corner is on page 34, which is the very end of the dock almost proceeds into the public space. And then you, like you say, there's those three boats there that need life jackets and so forth, which are tied up in our public space <coughs> and making our river smaller and more congested. So are you saying that get rid of those three boats on the end there, and if they were just within their, within their least space where they should be, then the, the, um, they, they wouldn't have this problem? Of, of space needed for, you know. I mean, what Kerry's saying is they need to be within their lease area, they're not, yeah. um, and therefore they're still looking to expand their gross floor area. Well, yeah. we, you know, we wouldn't want to do anything to support their direct community site. Exactly, okay, because look at that. that yeah. We have a, another, you know. Well, it, in the past, I understand it's been more than just those three boats. It's been um, craft stored on the beach as well, as well as in the water area itself. So. Yeah. Question, is there any capacity for this business to increase their lease area? Is there a process open to them for that? Uh, that's a process through the state. Um, yep. So that's something they would need to apply to the state. And the state would ask council for comment as to whether we would support the increase of the lease area. Okay, thank you. Okay, so some wish to refer to the motion to refer to the environment no further discussion, all those in favour, it was carried unanimously. We then move on to page 45. <coughs> that is it. This is a Planning Environment Court Appeal number 2974 of 2020 for the extension to a currency period. Um, it's an advice that uh, <coughs> the applicant has appealed our decision not to approve the um, extension at 6 Heron Street, Bridgian Beach. Kerry, this is the one we had the other appeal on that we wanted. Same side. Same side. Yeah, but different building. And yeah. Yep. So do we have any uh, this is some of the, the they didn't, it wasn't compliant <coughs> with disability access yeah, and things like that, wasn't right. it? Yeah. 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 One of the reasons for refusal yeah. was we um, considered that the building wouldn't be able to build because yeah. it wouldn't comply. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a, a good question. Um, with these, these buildings, it just, just seems like a, if there was something special about this building, for example, very, very um, energy efficient, um, uh, something that would enhance the, the environment, enhance the, the public amenity around it, and it was oversized, is that something that you would look at in terms of an application like this, just saying, well, it is a little bit big here, but they're giving us something else over here. They're, they're, they're benefiting the amenity around the area or, or lowering emissions and so forth. We'll let them slide. Is that, is that sort of a, of the way that, the, that, you, yeah. that you would look at a development application? Um, well, certainly anything that's proposed by the applicants that might benefit the community uh, is relevant for consideration in an application. Um, whether it warrants um, building a larger building that looks out of character with Phrygian, that's something we'd have to consider at the time. I think it'd come back to what the benefit to the community was because the risk of approving a larger building on a site means everybody else in the village will want the same size. Yeah. So there's, there's, there is no overarching public amenity that this is proposing? No, no. I mean, I have to say that the existing building is, is 
not of great architectural merit. Um, this is an improvement on what exists. So that's perhaps you know, the benefit at the moment. Yeah. I'm happy to move the recommendation. I'll second it. Councillor Stewart, any further comments? No? All those in favour? That was carried unanimously. We then move on to planning applications decided by delegated authority. And I'll leave the meeting with the declaration. Um, I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to number 90PW18 slash 0155.01 in the list of applications in the report. Mr. Shannon Gillard, who is related to the applicant CBD Settlers Co, PTY LTD, and his wife Kate, are friends of mine through our children. We socialise together occasionally. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I believe the nature of our relationship is not close and personal and council's consideration of this application is not to approve or reject it. It is only for noting the decision that has already been made by staff. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting and whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Thank you. Do you have any questions or clarifications? Um, if not, then I wish to move one of the two options in front of us. I'd love to move that to stairs. So, yes, we'll say, can you? I'll read that. Yeah. Um, that, that is in the public interest. Yeah. That is in the public interest that Councillor Stewart participates and votes in this matter because Council believes that she does not have a close personal relationship with Mr. Gillard and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Happy to second that. Any comments? Any further? No, I think it's all self-explanatory, just uh, those who are in favour and Council Stewart can't vote on this. That the carry unanimously with Council Stewart abstaining as is required. So do we have any comments or discussion about the range of approvals? Um, I've, only, I've noticed there's only one short-term accommodation application in out of the list, you know. I guess we we're suspecting that there's going to be a, a tsunami yeah, of them. Yeah. <laughs> what happened then? <laughs> we, yeah, we are getting a few, but very low numbers still. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I respect we've got 12 months for them to be lodged. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as I indicated last time, there are a number that people are lodging uh, where we aren't able to support, um, and we're giving them the reasons, and people are choosing to withdraw and get a partial refund. Um, but yeah, there are. There are obviously oh, some that are coming through. Kerry, you mentioned 12 months. Um, it's July 2021. So yeah, so 12, 12 months, months from, from when? The that the new plan was from the new right. planning scheme commenced, 31st of July. That's right. Any further discussion? I'd like to move the staff recommendation. Mm -hmm. Move that to Stuart Sector, Councillor Wigner, all those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you guys being busy? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. I mean, it's going great here yep. in Lisa. If you'd like to join us <laughs> Thanks, for Kerry. item five, which is the Lisa Council Carbon Footprint Report 2019 2020. Is there a report, Any? Lots of info in here. Lots of info, good. <laughs> And yeah, I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Just with our target of zero emissions, um, the last uh, on page sixty six, it says to achieve this ambitious target, mm -hmm. um, emissions modelling has shown that an annual reduction of eleven percent year upon year is required. Uh, and this financial year, we had a two percent reduction compared yes. to. The, so, is it is it achievable? Because I mean, that's a big difference between you know, 11 and 2, yeah. year in, year yeah. out. Yeah, that's right. It is achievable. Um, I mean, we're looking at net zero emissions, which is basically when we're, we've got our emissions and then we can also look at opportunities to draw down carbon as well, which is what we're investigating. So as you'll see in, in the report, it actually states that um, most of the um, emissions, the 63% of the emissions is actually from the landfill. So yes. we've got a number of strategies in place to actually actually help that yeah. and to reduce that. One being um, we're working very closely with um, the landfill gas contractor to improve the, the capture rate of the landfill gas. 
and also we're um, in the process of currently developing a um, waste strategy which is going to look at options to potentially remove or, or reduce the amount of organic matter going into the landfill which will subsequently um, reduce the, uh, the emissions from the landfill. So yes, it's tight, yes, it's difficult, and we certainly will have to start looking at potentially offsets as well and, and carbon drawdown, which we're also investigating. Yeah. Okay, well. Thank you. So, so that's basically, uh, we, we will get our final way forward in the way. Fine. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it, mate. It's incredible the, the, their mm. contribution to, the, to yeah, this. It is. And if, we, if we can solve that problem, then eventually we'll keep reducing our own emissions to get to a point where um, you know, we're not going to be able to reduce it to zero, mm. but we then do the offset, yeah. and that's, mm. the, that's when yeah. we have to make some decisions. Yeah, mm. okay, thank you. Yeah. So 2% is sobering, but on the flip side, uh, 25% reduction in the electricity consumption emissions and 28% uh, associated with the transport distribution of electricity is a, a good outcome. It's the easy wins from energy efficiency and, and renewable energy. Um, what, other than waste, what are the, the your learnings from the past year when you've done this audit? There's been a bit of uh, change as a result of the way we calculate things, but is there any other key learnings from assessing what we have achieved and haven't achieved over the last year? Oh, certainly the um, renewable energy and energy efficiencies has got just so many co-benefits um, around obviously reducing emissions and also the cost savings that we're achieving from that. Um, however, as we know, that's going to reach a floor. Um, we've had some improvements definitely in the way that we look at our, um, our scope three emissions for our uh, purchase goods and services and that's been a significant improvement in the past how we actually calculate that so that's getting more um, more accurate in the way that we can calculate that and also we're looking at the relevance of what emissions should actually be included in a carbon footprint and what shouldn't be there's also still a lot of work to do around as I keep on talking about we, we um, calculate and or estimate our sources of emissions but we don't actually do anything with our sinks and this is the, the work that we currently need to do to actually look at how much are we actually drawing down of carbon through our current and our um, future um, drawdown through vegetation management, through vegetation, revegetation, etc. So that's the some big learnings that I've, I've taken away from this. Is that likely to be a scale to make a significant dent in that, that waste management? <sighs> I can't give you that yeah. answer just yet. I, I can't preempt what the waste strategy is going to state and also what will come out of some new methodology that's coming out from the WRI next year to actually look at calculating the um, amount of carbon drawdown from the vegetative stock. Interesting because I, I used to work next door to a tree physiologist and he, was, he advised me once that the wet sclerical, so the flooded gum yes. brush box, is one of the highest. It is. Um, carbon storage of any forest in the world, so I'd be guessing um, that this came out when a Victorian scientist claimed that the mountain ash in Victoria were in, he said no, I think it's peer reduced. Yeah, you know, what we've got here in our dominant forests around uh, the Cloy and, and Mona and Kinkin area can store some of the highest levels of carbon. Yes. And there is methodology that is used for the Emissions Reduction Fund called the Full CAM, Full um, Accounting Cost Model, sorry, Full Accounting Model, Carbon Accounting Model. And so we're looking to see how that can actually be utilised to to calculate for our, our um, revegetation as well. But it's, yeah, there's quite a lot of learnings to do there. Other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, so Annie, um, the, this is, for council, so Correct. you know, not 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 for the, the the community at large. Can you put it, you know, kind of for for the multitudes watching, um, the the definition of, a, of of what this encapsulates and what it doesn't, you know, because th there's always this very gray area, which is our biggest area, which is um, waste going into the the bins mm -hmm. and you know newspaper, cardboard, and so forth going into our general waste and not yeah. being not going into the the yellow top bin. Um, can you yeah. do, do, kind of give us that overview? Yeah, sure. Um, the standards that we, we do these calculations and estimations in are called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, and there is a corporate standard for organisations. And we utilise that standard, and it determines 
It's based on the organisational control. So where we have got control of buildings and facilities and processes, etc., they are actually included in our overall footprint. So when you think about waste, and particularly, well, it's all the community waste, it's not just council waste, why is that actually included in our footprint? One, because it stands to say that they have to, but the reason for that is because it's under operational control. So what we can control in terms of our operations, so we actually tell our contractors how to actually manage that. We've got policies in place around occupational health and safety. So we overall control that. And so we've engaged with the contractor to uh, extract the landfill gas. So that's obviously another control measure. So even though it is all the community waste, it's still actually calculated in our organisational footprint because of that control definition. Just to clarify, Council even mentioned about the paper carpet, which was recycled, but the, maybe the more source of contamination in our red bins, the general waste, is people still using that for Correct. the organic waste, so yes. they might fill up their, their green bin, uh, green litter bin with palm fronds and then put all the, the clippings and that's what generates these yes. emissions, it's that mm. large volume of mm. food yeah. and mm. grass. And that's paper. right. And the other way that the, well, sorry, the way that the um, emissions are calculated from the landfill is by another wonderful calculation it's called the Engers Solid Waste Calculator. What that does is it not only calculates the emissions from this year's waste, but it actually goes back in time because we've got that legacy waste. Because we've, over years and years and years, <coughs> we've actually been depositing um, organic matter into the, into the landfill, the calculator actually um, also includes all those legacy waste emissions as well. So, it just dawned upon me that our cutting down <coughs> from 65% down to zero in the, the resource recovery area is impossible because we have that legacy waste. It, well, the way that it, that works, you actually get these curves where when you put organic matter into the into the landfill, you'll get um, and and you've got the right conditions for the methanogenic bacteria to do their their thing and basically produce all the methane. Uh, it, you've got actually different waste sorry curves of how much it actually generates over time. So when you first put in <coughs> in under the conditions, it takes a little while and then you get a real spike depending on the type of organic matter. And there are all these various curves. So um, typically food is, is one of the ones that actually generates it quite quickly and then that sort of dissipates off, etc. cetera. So um, we will always have the legacy waste in there and that's why the importance of maintaining the landfill gas capture from those legacy emissions as well. And that's where the offsetting is likely to come into Yes. Um, so, Annie, you, you're working on uh, a PhD which focuses on the trauma um, that our next generation, the younger generation, is feel towards the climate change emergency and uh, the, the helplessness and so forth. Um, and then we look at this and we say, gosh, we have to, in, since 2005 to, to now, in five years, we've cut 11%. Or is that um, now we have got to cut 11% every year to get to 2026, which is a, a, a huge effort. And I always think about, you know, how can we be mentally up to the task to actually do it and not just have it on paper and, and uh, perhaps bring some solace to the, the kids or some hope, you know, on, on, on where to move forward. It seems as though it's quite a giant step forward from where we are today to get to that. Yes, however, there is the solutions available. Yeah. Um, certainly we know that renewable energy, energy efficiency, they are absolutely a, a no-brainer um, to install on council buildings, on you know community buildings, on basically every building, any flat surface, let's stick solar panels on it. Um, because it makes it makes economic and uh, emission sense as well. And there are the solutions available for um, the landfill as well. We have to start looking at those as part of the waste strategy. Probably to answer your question, Tom, council could get to zero emissions, net emissions tomorrow if you wanted to. All you have to do is get out the checkbook yeah. and write out what you're going to buy. You wouldn't do that, of course, until you've got your own house in order about trying to reduce your actual emissions as much as you can from a practical point of view, which is why the you know, solar and roof being no-brainer because it makes economic and environmental sense to do that. 
we'll have the same challenge to get through the, um, the, the, the waste issue. How do we reduce that? It will make probably good economic sense and it will make um, good environmental sense. And we'll keep suppressing down from what I call an operational level to get our emissions as low as they can be. But we will have to um, then spend money to buy out that last element of that mm. to offset. And what offset the way we go about or how we do it, that's probably a couple of years away. But we need to work that through about how we do it. But as I said, some other councils, uh, one, I know one that's just said, we have got zero emissions because they've just got the checkbook out. Yeah. They haven't actually changed their operations. They're still producing mm. a lot of carbon and they could actually reduce that, but they just bought their way out of trouble. That's, that's the last resort, not the first. Yeah. With, um, with <coughs> Craig um, Doolin, has been talking about, you know, purchasing chunks of land in the Kin Kin area because he said we actually need more land to plant trees. We have more tree plantings than we have land to plant the trees. And you with the revolving fund, would you, would, uh, would you be in favor of looking for, you know, once again, going into the revolving fund, buying chunks of that, the Kin Kin improved land, which are denuded of trees and, uh, and, and, and putting the planting in there, chopping off a piece of that land, rezoning it for you know, a house in order that we can help pay for and then plant those trees and perhaps um, do some of our own sequestration. That's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll have a crack at it and Craig's in the audience as well can answer if he, if he wants to. But essentially that um, revolving fund for our environment levy is designed to make the ratepayers dollars go further. Um, but if we um, have a block of land and, and it's got an environmental protection on it, um, so if we buy a block of land under our environment levy, it's got environmental protection on it. It might have a house site that hasn't got environmental values. And we can, can we then sell that off and keep the other and, and push that money back into it? Um, that's a slightly different question to whether or not we should be doing active tree planting and then trying to recover carbon credits from that. That's a, that's a slightly different issue. Um, you know, we've got as a as a separate but related matter the Ewer Ringtail area where we have a firm looking to do major planting there. Um, to gain carbon credits that they were then selling to the industry, so there's a, a net benefit to the community. So I'm not sure that um, our solution will be broad scale tree planting by council to resolve the final carbon credit issues we've got to deal with, sorry, the carbon load we've got to deal with. Not too sure that would stack up. But I don't know if Craig wanted to add anything to that. I, I'm just, I guess, historically the environment lead has always used, been used to purchase high value in the environmental land, which has been a completely valid thing to do. Um, as developments in the carbon market occur, probably for the first time ever, we're at a point where there's opportunities for revegetation that essentially cost council nothing. Um, that will not count towards our zero net emissions because it, us being able to do it for nothing means other companies will get the carbon credits. So the discussion's a little bit different. But as we review the conservation land guideline in the new year, and those discussions we're having with the environment we're working with, we are talking about whether we should start to think about purchasing strategically placed plant blocks, recognising that other companies will be able to come in and at zero cost to us essentially re vegetate <coughs> that land. Um, but also as we get closer to 2026 and we're looking for offset opportunities, um, I would really like to think that if we're investing ourselves in offset opportunities, mm. we're investing in NUSA. Um, we're not investing yeah. in other areas. Mm. So, um, so there's the short term where companies now are looking for locations, and there's a long term 2026 that if we're going to do offsets, <coughs> let's do it here and let's have it ready to go. But that's that's the discussion I'm looking for. And I think that that was one of, I suppose, um, I think we'll move a slightly amended recommendation because I think this council needs to consider these issues. And so I'll, I'll move the staff recommendation with the addition that mm. staff be requested to organise a workshop with councillors to review future initiatives with the name of updating our strategic approach to achieve zero net emissions by 2026. Our, well, what's the end called future initiatives? Our plan future initiatives with the name Achieve zero in emissions by 2026. Oh. Yeah, Sorry. so have that. Sorry. So, okay. uh, yeah, so go back to that staff be requested to organise a workshop for councillors to review planned initiatives with the aim with the aim to just take out the word updating. Mm. 
achieve Council's stated goal of zero net emissions by 2026. That's exactly what Zero net emissions. Should we state that's a target rather than goal? That might be new yeah. work, doesn't it? Really. Your goal sounds like it's still like the CEO requests the CEO. Make it a target. So I'd go target. Change the goal to target. Choose the target. Yeah, council stated target. No. Instead of goal, after two words after the word count. Take goal out. I'm not the second mate. I'll second. second. Oh, you did. <laughs> 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 it was simultaneous. Oh, okay. You go to it. Cancelling that. <laughs> he's generated my thinking on this. Um, I think there's one big issue there about we have to start making decisions about whether we're going to look at the cost of local offsetting versus international offsetting with social benefits across the globe um, because one can be cheaper than the other. Um, the other one that's not mentioned that I saw in the future initiatives, which I know Councillor Sindel's uh, been very uh, keen on since you came into Council, and that is about how we bring our our suppliers and our mm -hmm. service providers along with us oh, that we yes, actually yeah. haven't at this stage got a policy that's adopted that says yes, they ourselves be on the journey mm -hmm. with us, yes. and um, I think that's one we have to talk about. And I think just generally harnessing all the mm -hmm. all this current council thinking about how we may. Uh, need to accelerate or change uh, programs. So that's why I suggested. Mm. And can I just make a comment with that regarding? Firstly, I would like to say thank you for the fabulous report that you bought, and it's really obvious of the depth of work and commitment that you've undertaken in this role. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, having no prior experience around all this emission stuff in a you know corporate world, um, you made it easy to understand and absorb and I think um, I just want to acknowledge the work you've done today. Thank yeah, thank you. Um, and I'd just like to make a comment on future initiatives. Um, missing from that also was anything around, um, you've got landfill emissions, transport fuels, electricity consumption, offsets around uh, residential emissions, community engagement, which is fabulous. Um, following on from our discussion today around planning application and benefits back to the community, Moving forward, is there any plan to um, communicate back to the planning department and work with them as an option to developers or applicants to include the idea of how they could value add to that development to help bring down and recover carbon credits within the shire? Yeah. <clears throat> Do you want me to respond? Yeah, there certainly has been significant discussion with the planning department mm -hmm. and all throughout the development of the plan there has been um, <coughs> considerations around requiring development to actually put in renewable energy, mm -hmm. to put in infrastructure for electric vehicles, etc. So that's certainly been around in there and um, my understanding, and I'm not a planner, is that um, it was the state requirement that the, there was the reliance on the building code of Australia okay. to actually incorporate all of those sorts of things in there. Just, okay. just okay. explain that in the first draft of the planning scheme which went out to community engagement, mm. how long ago that was, um, we actually had provisions in there which tried to have um, high levels of requirements for um, building requirements, so rooftop, solar, water tanks, all that sort yeah. of stuff that would make um, properties more um, environmentally sustainable and, and from a carbon perspective and a, and mm. a water management perspective. Um, the state government insisted we take those out and the reason was that they um, say that there should be uniform requirements across all building in Queensland and that if there are going to be changes for that type of thing, they should be done through the building code that would apply to all places, rather than having each shire have different rules. Yeah. We didn't agree with that. Mm. Um, we argued pretty strongly, but at the end of the day, they insisted. Mm. So there's a way around that, Rich, yeah. um, looking at what other organisations are doing. Um, <coughs> some, some big corporations are including social responsibility strategies, and sustainability um, initiatives. 
So could we look at maybe having a NUSA Council social strategy? Mm, and so not only an application is therefore um, subject or has to meet um, what our social strategy um, responsibility policy is. Um, I'll, I'll answer that one. The short answer is no. We can only assess development applications against our planning scheme. So if we're going to have requirements for what that need would be in a, in a planning sense, they have to be in the planning scheme. And that's the problem we ran into. We wanted to put those in to have those high level requirements and the state wouldn't allow it. So that would be an ideal, I think everyone in this room would agree with you. Mm. <laughs> that's what we should be doing. Um, but we need the planning scheme to have that incrementer so that if someone is making an application, they know what requirements they have to meet. And until the state allows councils to have higher levels of assessment for um, carbon or environmental type activities in relation to building codes, uh, we're going to be struggling. Or alternatively, which they did have a few years ago, they had um, stuff in the building code which had higher standards. And the development industry pushed back. They said that that pushed up the cost of housing and was affecting housing affordability. And so they got it taken out. That's where it should be. And I think the last comment when I look at planned initiatives that aren't in there, uh, we have to call out the state government for being baboons at the behest of the development industry. Because when you look at affordable housing, you should be looking at affordable living. Mm. And what might be a little bit below the profit margin for a developer means that people living in that house for the next 15 years have lower cost of living. Mm. And whole, so, whole lot of cost, yeah. whole lot of yeah. cost. And so, to me, the initiative of, you know, there's a range of reasons why the argument of the building code should be the primary thing for anything to do with the building is flawed, because the building code should deal with structural advocacy, and planning should be able to express a community's views and values. And when we put out to that community, my recollection was we had very little, if none, complaints about the process of trying to make it a mandatory environment. And that's where it should be in this day and age. It shouldn't be. It mm. should be part of it, and it should be built into all developers. Now, the development industry have realised the marketing benefits, so a lot of the larger ones are now doing mm. it as a matter of yeah. course. You know, you, you know, sign up today, and you'll get a, a free battery mm. system as well. So, yeah. But to me, I think that is part of the issue of whether we continue to go on the front foot and call out what was a poor decision at the time, and it's the continued to be one that keep on that. Annie, I've just got one more question, and sort of comes back to what Brett said um, about one particular council just buying their way out of trouble. How are other councils? What are they doing? What are their targets? Where are we in comparison to, I guess, similar yep. sized councils? Okay, it's quite variable. Um, most councils have probably gone from uh, 2040 to 2050 so we've been very ambitious okay. um, however what this, the current climate science now is is that really those 2050 targets are too late okay. um, we really need to bring those targets back to 2030 yeah. and so we should be working towards as a maximum of net zero emissions by 2030 um, so in terms of other councils, they're quite variable and this is a discussion that I've been having with a number of the forums around a definition of net zero emissions um, because the standard that we use is the cli uh, sorry, um, Climate Active Standard which used to be called the National Carbon Offset Standard or N NCOS. Um, that's what a lot of organ organisations and councils are actually measuring too, but there's quite a lot of variability on what's in and what's out. So for example, if a council doesn't own and operate a landfill, they've put that out to a third party, they don't inclu include that into okay. their scope one emissions. Yeah. However, technically, they should be included in their yeah. scope three emissions, sure. but a lot of them don't. And I've been... Mm -hmm. um, within one of the, the counterparts that um, my, my peers all get together, I've been pushing that we need to have a set definition yeah. of what that actually means so that we're all comparing apples with, ap with apples. Um, if some councils aren't including all of the scope threes, they haven't done the relevance tests that we've been doing, mm. it's very difficult to compare apples with apples. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and some loopholes by the sounds of it. Yeah. The other thing that's happening is some councils might be buying carbon credits for overseas that might be used seven dollars yeah. a ton as an example. Yeah, right. Um, where the accreditation or the test about whether that's actually being um, genuine is yeah, how do you pay? Whereas if you're buying in Australia, you might be paying what 15, 17 dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a ton. 
Um, so it's a different way to, yeah. to deal with it as well. So. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, yeah. sorry, I've got one long question, you guys. So, if, first of all, Annie's doing a PhD on the, um, the well, actually, would you, can, can you tell us quickly what your PhD is, and then I've got a follow on question from that. Okay. In the context of this item. Yeah, in yeah. the context of this item, okay, it's around uh, climate, uh, sorry, climate anxiety because the youth of today are feeling very, very disempowered, very frustrated. They're um, experiencing a future very different to what their parents and their grandparents are um, dealing with. And so they are feeling very, very stressed about it and um, very frustrated and very concerned about it. So what I'm looking at to see is if um, how you can actually alleviate some of that eco-anxiety and particularly by looking at um, some interventions such as tree planting and education, etc. But it's only early days and I've got to get confirmed before we can talk about it too much time. <laughs> and then the opportunity... Be 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's opportunities as well like that, that, you know, for us out there as leaders because, Absolutely. you know, if there's one thing to just trudge along and, and just, you know, have a target there and, and, you know, get stressed about not getting to that target and so forth. The other flip side of the very same coin is the opportunities that are presenting themselves in, in new set. You know, for example, with the digital hub and so forth, it, it are very good at, uh, we want to, we pride ourselves on taking it, you know, moving into these opportunities yeah. and doing well with them. So what are some opportunities that we oh, have here? They're huge. And there's been a number of uh, really good seminal reports. One is being, um, the Clean Jobs Plan from the Climate Council, and they've identified um, 12 ways to, to basically kickstart the economy post-COVID. And it's going to have create jobs um, for those people who have already got the skills, and um, it's also going to help reduce emissions. And that's about supporting large-scale utility um, energy. Um, certainly looking at uh, ecosystem restoration projects, sustainable transport, um, looking at community scale and microgrids, so really helping to, to facilitate those, and of course organic waste um, reductions. So they've, the Climate Council is sort of the eminent research organisation within Australia, and they're um, suggesting that over 72,000 jobs could actually be created by looking at clean, green jobs. It's a whole stimulus. A number of um, states and territories are actually implementing that. Victoria has just put out their whole climate change strategy, which is to do exactly this. And in fact, the um, Cities Power Partnership, they also have got um, an economic um, recovery solutions to create local jobs by uh, tackling long-term challenges. And that again is looking at renewable energy, re um, revegetation and restoration projects, energy efficiencies and assisting the community with energy efficiencies and uptake of solar. Um, and there's a whole lot of, uh, there's basically 12 points that we can actually really grow and um, develop that clean economy post COVID. And so that was a joint statement um, that was put out by a series of mayors and councillors, including um, Councillor Stockwell. So. On behalf of this council, I suppose that's the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that City Power Partnership and the Climate Emergency Australia group also had a very similar list that they were they advocated in the letter to the Prime Minister that uh, while we think locally as a collective, uh, we have the, the, the minds and voices of many people around Australia and using that as a part of the broader push because obviously systemic change at the highest level will have the greatest effect. I think the other thing for Councillor Wigner is uh, the Council's Health and Wellbeing Plan uh, has specifically identified the issues of climate anxiety as something that we should be looking further into as part of the Climate Change Response Plan. Um, because obviously when that was being developed, some of the statistics about 30% you know, of, of youth were considering not having a child because of their mm -hmm. concerns. Um, so uh, the, obviously I've got children in that age and the flip side is it doesn't have to be boom and gloom. You know, if, if we look um, uh, last Friday with the Environmental Education Hub being launched at the, the Forum for Environment and NRM groups, you know, that was a group of grade nine students who did a, a hands-on practical learning session about the fires last year plus climate change and they got motivated and they said to, they came to us and um, said we want to be an advocacy group, we want to 
to be involved in making helping council make decisions about how to go forward and that is the way to get over the anxiety is to empower and feel like you can make change. Yeah. I think the other opportunity is in the um, our local economic plan as well. So we've seen how amazing the digital hub is doing by actually attracting those types of high value jobs into the region. Um, I think we need to start looking at the overall approach of how do we actually attract green jobs in and grow the green jobs that are already here yeah. um, because it's you know, just energy efficiencies, if we went and facilitated or assisted a, a program to actually go and um, make all of our low cost housing or rentals or whatever, um, provide some assistance with that, um, that provides jobs for a whole series of tradespeople, for example. We currently are providing, um, sorry, this is going out to the community bit, but the um, free advice line that our residents can actually just ring up and get assistance and advice on um, implementation of solar or energy efficiency to help them reduce their their bills etc but certainly you know by really targeting and putting a, a clean green recovery on the cards and at the, the top of mind I think there is opportunity to get you know sort of kill a number of st uh, birds with a few stones um, one being certainly a, a, the COVID economy and certainly um, emissions reduction as well and job creation and there's I've heard that the other you know, countries will be looking and, and want to do business with greener, you know, and, and we want to make sure we're on the right side of the line. Absolutely. We'll miss out if, if we don't. I mean, Australia's already mm. struggling because our, our um, partners, our trading partners have actually made commitments to net zero emissions by certain dates and Australia is falling behind in that aspect. Do we have any more comments or discussions on the motion? Be moved and seconded. Talk the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. That's Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you. Very important. Mm. You should do a PhD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it. Try to keep it quiet. <laughs> there have been no confidential sessions. That brings our meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.